Değerli katılımcılar, değerli dostlar, sosyal medya platformları üzerinden bizi izleyen güzel insanlar, TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimleri Araştırma Enstitüsü, tüm araştırma ve eğitim faaliyetlerini giderek artan kararlılık ve azimle bilimin ufukları kapsamında ve dünyanın en önde gelen üniversitelerinden bilim insanlarının katkılarıyla sürdürmeye devam etmektedir. Bugün matematiksel fizik ve uygulamalı matematik seminer serimiz kapsamında harika bir seminer gerçekleştirmek üzere bir araya gelmiş bulunmaktayız. Bu sefer İngiltere'nin Cambridge Üniversitesi'nden son derece değerli bir bilim insanı Profesör Fernando Covedo ile temel fizikte büyük keşifler ve büyük zorlukları konuşacağız. Seminerimiz İngilizce olarak gerçekleştirilecektir. Bu nedenle İngilizce devam edeceğim sizin izninizle. Dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, hello everyone and good evening. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to inform you that this evening we have another wonderful episode of our mathematical physics and applied mathematics seminar series with our very special speaker. Professor Fernanda Coevedo from the University of Cambridge, distinguished scientist and world-class expert in the field of fundamental physics. He has kindly accepted our invitation to join us for this seminar and will give a great talk under the title, Great Discoveries and Major Challenges in Fundamental Physics. At the end of the talk, we will have a question answer session the questions can be asked by sending a message through the chat button of the Zoom platform or just by raising hand. Professor Fernanda Coevedo is a Guatemalan theoretical high energy physicist. He holds a professorship in theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, and a fellow of Gonvilla and Chaos College since 2001. From 2009, to 2019, so for 10 years, he was the director of ICTP, Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Fernanda Coevedo obtained his PhD at the University of Texas under the supervision of Nobel laureate Stephen Weinberg. His research has been mostly focused on formal, phenomenological, and cosmological aspects of field and string theories. He has numerous awards such as 1998 ICTP Prize, a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, a Royal Society Wolfson Award, the Abdus Salam Medal of the World Academy of Science, the Spirit of Salam Award, and honorary degrees from the University of University of San Carlos and Del Valle of Guatemala and the University of Chiapas in Mexico. Professor Abdus Salam once said, scientific thought and it is creation is the common and shared heritage of mankind. With this, I want to invite the former director of ICTP, the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, Professor Fernando Coevedo to the stage to begin his talk. Fernando, we are very happy to have you with us. Please begin your talk. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alegram, for this kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here to share with you some time. And uh, uh, so Alegram asked me to give a very general talk because of the audience will be mixed with the students and, and scientists, engineers. So I will do my best to, to, to convey the message. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so first of all, well, I would like to, to say that I have a great, great uh, uh, admiration for, for Turkey in general. I have been there several times and, and uh, uh, I have very good friends also there. So it's always a pleasure to participate in activity in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Turkey. And uh, well, in particular for now this presentation, I was pleased to have been invited. I'm very pleased to, to, to participate and give my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm, uh, the idea here is to, to summarize. Usually we, 
we listen in the news many things that have been happening in science. So I'll try to summarize the, the, what we consider the most important discoveries for the last 25 or 30 years in fundamental physics. And, and what are the main challenges and, and what people are trying to do to address these challenges. <clears throat> okay. So since the, we have a mixed audience, we'll try to, to start with this uh, very simple diagram that you can always see. Just start this is just to get an idea about, about the scales with the, the human scale, and then we can go to planets uh, and galaxies all the way to the size of the universe. And you go from the bigger size, or you can go to the smaller size to uh, cells and, and atoms, nuclei, elementary particles, and the smallest possible thing that I, we will discuss in my talk. Um, and uh, the point of this, the present, presenting it in this way is just to understand the universe, the biggest things in the world, we need to understand the smallest things in the world, which are the elementary particles and how they interact and, and so on. So in the, in the sense that that's, that's how my, my presentation would be based. <clears throat> okay. Um, sorry. Good. And um, as Ali can say, uh, well, my supervisor, Steven Weinberg, just passed away uh, uh, three months ago. It's a great loss for science and in general. Uh, uh, I, I'm totally biased, but I consider him and many of us consider him probably the most important physicist uh, in the past 50 to 60 years. And um, I always try to use his uh, advice and his quotes. And this is one of that I, I particularly like, and I usually do it in my, in my when I give my lectures is that uh, what is the purpose of theoretical physics and it is not to describe the world as we find it but it's to explain in the very few fundamental principles why the world is the way it is so that that's essentially what uh, I, I see what theoretical physics is and that's what Weinberg has uh, always uh, emphasized <clears throat> so, so let me start with what, what we call fundamental so what I, I claim we have two fundamental theories and from which all the, the physics is based on. And uh, the first one is quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics essentially is, is what describes the physics of the uh, microscopic physics, the smallest possible things. Uh, there is a, a the standard equation that, that defines the, the quantum mechanics is a, the, what's called the Schrodinger equation. Uh, it's, it's in terms of, of a function psi, which is a, called a wave function. It's a function of uh, probabilities. And it is the, probably the biggest revolution in science ever, so over a hundred years ago, essentially starting. Um, <clears throat> essentially, it tells us many things that we were kind of anti-intuitive for our perspective, being our cell microscopic objects, um, that uh, how the universe works at the microscopic level. And uh, an important uh, quantities is here what is called h bar which is a constant which is uh, called Planck's or well, or Dirac's constant which is extremely small 10 to the minus 35 kilograms meter square over a second uh, so <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's something to keep in mind if h bar is zero we recover all, quant all classical physics from Newton and Maxwell and so on if h bar is different from zero but is very small we have the quantum domain in which very strange things happen, um, like uh, passing through barriers or or, or things that that that, that uh, like the, what we call the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle saying that we cannot determine the position or the velocity of a particle at the same time. Only and the, the uh, uncertainty in both p here is momentum, mass times velocity, and x is position. And so the the unknown part of both position and momentum, the product of those has to be greater than h bar. So since h bar is very small, so we, we always believe that we can just uh, de determine the position and, and the momentum of a particle, but uh, being h bar very small, but non-zero, then we cannot determine the two things simultaneously. One way to see it is that you see, this is naive expectation. We have a little ball in, in, in the bowl. Uh, so it, at some point it will stay still. But that is this classical picture. But the quantum picture, this one, essentially says it's not around, it's not possible. So it has to always be fluctuating. Just we, so you cannot determine the position or velocity. You know the position, you don't know the velocity. So that means that the velocity will be changing. And you know the velocity, you don't know the position. So the quantum fluctuations are 
the ba the, the the the the basic thing in in in in quantum mechanics, and so it's based because on this uncertainty principle. That was the first fundamental theory. The second fundamental theory, and there are only two, is special relativity. Special relativity, again, uh, over 100 years ago, essentially, um, <clears throat> uh, is Einstein's big discovery, which is essentially studying the structure of space and time. And uh, uh, so you can describe the space and time uh, in terms of a, the position of an observer. And there is something called the, the, the, the light cone, meaning that if you have space and time, no direction, then the velocity is, is, is, is, is the slope. And uh, uh, there's a maximum velocity, which is constant, is the speed of light, is three ten, times 10 to the eight meters per second. Again, since it is so big, uh, in the past people thought it was probably infinite, but it's, it's, it's, it's, it's big, but it's finite, and it's constant, so you cannot go beyond that speed. So that's what the, the, the light cone describes, that uh, you send a signal has always to lie inside the light cone, because this is where the speed is smaller than the speed of light. and uh, at uh, at this uh, 45 degrees, you have the speed of light, and after that, it will be bigger than the speed of light, so you cannot communicate this point to that point. Okay, and that essentially uh, allowed Einstein to unify a space and time into one single um, unit called space time. <clears throat> and, and again, uh, as H bar played a role for quantum mechanics, the speed of light C plays a role in special relativity. Okay, so based on, out of those two things, we have. Uh, uh, we know what uh, uh, essentially everything fundamental in physics is. And, uh, and it is now uh, reflected in what we call the standard model. <clears throat> and the standard model is a, a standard model of particle physics. So essentially combining special relativity and quantum mechanics, Wigner in the 1930s described that the, the, the fundamental objects based on the symmetries of special relativity and um, based on quantum mechanics are states, and these states are uh, classified by, by some numbers, which are spin, mass, and so on. And that's what we call an elementary particle. And the standard model is a particular case of that, and which describes all the particles that we know in nature. So the particles of matter, they have spin one half, using an internal angular momentum, and they are quarks and leptons. The quarks make uh, uh, the neutrons and protons inside the nuclei, and uh, <clears throat> Of, of, of atoms, and then the leptons include the electron and uh, the neutrino. And the electron, just to complete the, the, the atom to make it electrically neutral. And neutrinos, we don't see them in atoms, but they are produced, for instance, uh, in the sun, when, they are, when the sun is burning, produces these particles, neutrinos, which are, <clears throat> are very light and they're electrical, electrically neutral. And we can have hun uh, uh, hundreds or th uh, thousands of uh, millions of uh, Neutrinos passing our body every single second, and we don't see it because they interact very weakly. And uh, but they're fundamental for, for the sun to, to burn, and that's, that means fundamental for our life. So those are the particles of matter. Uh, they're they're based that the, uh, uh, <clears throat> they can be used, uh, written in this uh, uh, group theoretical way. It probably is not important for for the level of my presentation. The important thing is that they have a mass and they have a spin, one half, as, and uh, According to Wigner, the spin of the particles can be an integer or half an integer. Uh, there's a simplest case, which is spin zero. And that was one of the biggest discoveries if I, my, for my, the title of my talk. is one of the greatest discoveries of this century in 2012, predicted actually by, by Weinberg and, and Salam in the, in the 1960s. Uh, this particle had to be there because that's responsible to give a mass to all the other particles and so on. And it's uh, represented usually by this kind of a diagram where in what is called a, a, a sym broken symmetry and uh, in which the, the if you can see a, a, a symmetry here, which is on the rotations, this point is, is, is symmetric, but it's not the minimum. The minimum is not symmetric because you have a gen the, the degeneracy of them. And that's, that's what the broken symmetry is. And that's what this particle does that. And by breaking the symmetry, it provides masses to all the other particles essentially. And uh, the evidence for seeing it is this little bump in the data when you have a collision of proton-proton collisions at CERN in Geneva at very high energies, the highest energies uh, that, that have been produced in the lab. And that means that, that is the smallest we can see in nature in distance, highest energies, the smallest measure, the smallest distance. So these are like the modern day microscopes. 
And uh, that's how the, the Higgs particle was very difficult to be discovered because you needed a lot of energy to create it. And, uh, and then that's a, a big, and by discovering the Higgs, essentially close the, <clears throat> the whole standard model that includes also the forces of nature. The forces of nature are particles also, and they have uh, integer spin, and three forces have spin one, and one force has spin two. The <clears throat> spin, the famous spin one, the one that we all know is the electromagnetic force, and that the, the corresponding particle that is the mediating of the electromagnetic force is called the photon, which is the particle of light. Uh, then there are weak and strong interactions, which are at the, at the subnuclear level. And, um, and the, uh, they are also described by particles. In, but now, the, in the case of the weak interactions, there are massive particles called Ws and Z bosons uh, that are, actually were predicted by Weinberg and Salami in the 1960s. And the gluons, the gluons are the ones that keep the quarks together to make a proton and a neutron and then the, the nuclear of atoms. And, and so those are the three interactions mediated by particles of spin one. And then there's one single interaction mediated by particles of spin two, and that's called gravity. It's interesting that according to the classification of, of Wigner, we cannot go beyond that. So we can say, oh, what about a spin higher than two? At, uh, five has uh, three, et cetera. They may exist particles of that, but they will not mediate interactions. So essentially, uh, it's just from the use of the fundamental theories, quantum mechanics and relativity, especially relativity, we can uh, essentially uh, argue that the, sense that the fundamental particles of the, uh, in the universe should be particles of spin zero, one half, one, and two. And uh, we skip three halves, but, but in principle, it, should be, it, it could be possible. Okay, so this is a very simple picture, but that essentially every single object we have seen in the universe, including ourselves, is made out of these particles and, and it is interacting through these particles. So this is considered one of the greatest achievements in humankind. And it was only achieved in, in the, the past uh, 60 years or so. And as I say, the, it, it was confirmed by the discovery of the Higgs. All these other particles were discovered before. And the only one left to be discovered is the graviton. And we know why, because gravity is very weak and then it will, it will be much more difficult to be detected. <clears throat> so I will turn on my light because uh, it's, it's getting dark here. Very good. Okay, <clears throat> so and these are the forces that I told, the strong electromagnetic gravitation and weak forces, and they're mediated by the different particles. Okay, the, the, the photon is massless, so the, the, the interaction is long range. The graviton is also massless, the interaction is long range. Whereas the, the weak interactions, the particles have to be massive, and that means short range. And the one for the strong interactions, they're also massless, but they are, they are confined because the, strong, the interactions are very strong. So they're confined with the quarks and, and the gluons to make the, the, the, the protons, the neutrons, and many other particles. Okay, this is simple to describe in a mathematical way. So this is a mathematical physics seminar. Uh, you can write the question, the main equation in terms of what is called Lagrangian. And this describes gravity, this describes the electromagnetism and all the other interactions. They describe all the particles of matter, the kinetic energy of them, and how they couple to to to to to, to the spin one particles, to to the to the, yes, to, to the interactions. This is how they couple to the Higgs. This is the inter uh, kinetic energy for the Higgs, and this is the potential energy for the Higgs, which as I was showing to you in the previous slide. And essentially, that is all we need to describe uh, uh, the universe. Essentially. <clears throat> You may have been surprised that when I said there are two fundamental theories, and I mentioned special relativity and quantum mechanics, and didn't mention general relativity. And the reason is that general relativity is just a particular case for the for one of these interactions. There are all the interactions, uh, and then general relativity only describes one interaction, which is gravity. And so that's one of the one that mediated by the particles of spin two. Uh, however. Uh, is, is probably Einstein's greatest discovery. And uh, you can see he has, he said is his happiest mo moment in his life. You can see him very happy because he discovered special relativity was um, uh, uh, essentially space time was the, the, the, the was through special relativity was a single unit. And what general relativity says is that gravity itself, interaction with no gravity can be understood in terms of the, of the curvature of space and time, which is a, it's a beautiful geometric uh, uh, 
result of Einstein. And one of the things that the uh, general relativity predicts is black holes. We believe that there's a black hole at the center of, a, uh, of our galaxy and, and the center of almost every, every galaxy, uh, which are, are uh, concentrations of a lot of matter in a very small space. And, uh, uh, and uh, you can see the first image, one of the very important discoveries in the last uh, couple of years, is that there's a first image of, of a black hole after so many years. And you can see that the Nobel Prize for that last year also was for people who were working in, in, on black holes. And what I think is probably one of the greatest discoveries in many, many years is gravitational waves. In the same way that we have electromagnetic waves, like uh, uh, all the colors that we see of light, Gravity also fluctuates and gravity also has waves. And uh, it, it was only in 2016, only five years ago, that they were actually detected in, in, in, in this experiment called LIGO and Virgo. And essentially it was impressive because it's a collision of two black holes uh, 1.2 billion years ago. And that was such a dramatic event that it produced a huge uh, uh, uh, fluctuations of the space and time. And that had been traveling for 1.2 billion years, and it was detected in this uh, in this experiment. And now, this is uh, uh, many of the similar events have been discovered in the past five years. So now it's becoming uh, a, a, probably one of the areas with more future is especially this gravitational waves because there will be um, a, a big. It's, it's a new way to see the universe. Before we had seen the universe only essentially through the light, through the photons. Now we can see it through through gravity and there will be many new developments in the coming years because of this. Just to give you an idea, the gravitational wave that have been explored is of the order of uh, the frequency of the order of Hertz. Whereas in the electromagnetism, we know we have explored all, many, many, many frequencies and the visible uh, region is very small, but you have the microwaves, you have the X-rays, cosmic rays and so on, and ranging over many orders of magnitude and frequencies. And that is still yet to be done for for for gravity, so it's, it's plenty of uh, future to see. As you, this is what, what I can see, uh, what people have been exploring now. This kind of frequencies, there are plans to explore with a huge uh, gravitational wave interferometers in the future. A project called LISA uh, that would be in space. Uh, if, the, if the experiment here on Earth was four kilometers laser beams, in in space it would be millions of kilometers with, with three satellites combined. And but it, it will be coming up as hopefully in the next uh, uh, 15 years or so. <clears throat> Very good. So essentially all that is, is give us the, the basics to understand the universe. And then you can start uh, trying to understand the history of the universe. And uh, so there's a, don't be a, a scared about these equations, but at least this is a very simple way to write the space and time this time, and this is the, the three dimensions of space in, in, in, in uh, spherical coordinates. Um, here, A is, is a scale factor, depending on time, in terms of how much the universe expands. K is a, is, a, is, a, is a number that can be zero, one, or minus one. It tells you the universe is open, flat, or closed. And, and as I said, that's it. And with that, we can just uh, explore how the, the, this is the, how the velocity, this A dot is the, is the is the speed of, of this uh, uh, accelerate of the, of the scaling of, of the universe. And you can describe the, uh, the equations and see uh, um, that the universe can expand. Essentially, using the, essentially the basics of Einstein's theory in a very simple uh, example, you can explore essentially how the universe expands. And uh, early in the universe, people have proposed that the sense um, that, that that expansion of the universe at some point can bring you back to a value where the, the, the scale factor is very, very small, almost zero. And that we cannot describe it with the physics we know so far. <clears throat> that would be what people call the Big Bang. But a, a, sec, a fraction of a second after is something called inflation. That is uh, very much um, believed to be the description of the universe in the very, at the very beginning, a fraction of, of a second after the Big Bang. And uh, um, <clears throat> that means that the universe had, it's called inflation because it is, an exponential expansion in very short time. And after that, then the universe expands as it is more or less as it expands today in a much slower. And, and you can compute things on how far it is expanding and whatever 
there will be quantum fluctuations, which are represented here by this delta phi, like the quantum fluctuations I told you from the uncertainty principle, and, and they can be uh, computed and they can be tested experimentally. So this, all this has given us this picture that probably you have seen it, but it is, it is just, you have the big band where we don't know. You have this period of inflation, which is a certain inflation, and then the universe has been expanding over. And then we have now a, another period of, of accelerated expansion, which we call dark energy that I will mention later on. Uh, and at the very, very beginning, you have this uh, inflation, you have this fluctuations at, at, at, the, at, the, uh, at, the, at this stage, the universe was very small. So the fluctuations were quantum fluctuations, microscopic. <clears throat> and uh, and then the, the, the all the particles were there were no atoms or anything because the, the, the, there was it was very hot so all the particles were colliding with themselves the electrons the protons the photons all of them were were were, were like a big suit uh, and there at some point something very important happened uh, well when we have almost almost three minutes there were the first uh, nuclei and and and and, and the, uh, that, that you can you can have you can call uh, nuclear synthesis, uh, and there's a famous book of uh, Weinberg precisely called the first three minutes of the universe that uh, has was it's an old book that, that we all uh, learn cosmology by by reading that book at that time, and of course now there are many other ones, but just to have the idea that someone at that time was telling you you can see you can explain what happened in the first three minutes of the universe is, is impressive, and um, but then the universe starts expanding and then it's getting colder and colder. It's getting colder and at some point, uh, 300,000 years after the beginning, the, the, the, the, it was cold enough, the temperature was not that high, and then the, the proton was able to, to trap an electron into the first atom. That managed to liberate, uh, to free the, all the, the photons, which are the particles of light, because now, now the, the atoms were electrically neutral, so the photons were free there. And this moment, which is a very special moment, uh, uh, 300,000 years after the beginning of the universe, has been uh, stamped in, in, in what is called the cosmic microwave background that was observed in the 1960s. So I will mention that. So this is the best evidence we have of the Big Bang because this moment has, is seen daily and can be detected at any moment that all these photons have been, that produced, were, not, were produced at that time are getting to us in, from all the directions. After that, the people call what is called the dark ages, and then then the matter because of gravity is the dominant force. The, the, all the other interactions were very short range, or uh, the atoms were electrically neutral, so gravity dominated, and then it attracted a part of the matter because of, of, of these fluctuations, and the matter became stars and then galaxies, and you have uh, the universe that we know today. Uh, so this is a similar picture, just to uh, emphasize that. This is the, the, the moment where we can, <clears throat> this uh, cosmic background was created 300,000 years at the, at the beginning of the universe. It is nothing compared to the 3.8 billion years of the universe, uh, but it misses all this uh, first 300,000 years. However, if gravity, uh, uh, gravity was uh, uh, uh, free much earlier at the very beginning, so inflation or before that, so if we detect this waves from gravity, we, be, we may be looking at the universe much earlier. This has not happened, it has not been detected, but it's something to look after. Okay. And the evidence, we have the Hubble's law, which is just tell you how, how fast the universe is, is, is expanding. That's an old story from the 1920s. This is a, a more, a more recent measurements. And then the cosmic microwave background that I told you before, it was detected in the 60s. And it was more or less like this, that it looks the same in all directions. However, in the 1990s, that was one of the big discoveries that I, I wanted to emphasize today. People realized that you look at the sky, actually in different points, there are different colors, <clears throat> or different uh, temperatures, and that would be different densities. Uh, and uh, so, but they, they differ from each other by 10 to the minus five. So and that's, that's why the, they were not discovered before because it was the difference was very small in uh, in, in, in, in, in, the, in the in the in the amplitude of these fluctuations, and these fluctuations are quantum fluctuations similar to the things I told you at the beginning from the from the uncertainty principle. And uh, over the years, people have been 
uh, becoming more and more precise. So now, uh, now, now this experiment in, in, in WMAP was saw this one, the difference were much more precise. And even uh, now Planck, which is the, the, the latest satellite that uh, has been seen at, at this at, at a very, very, very uh, a, a small precision. And because of that, you can detect in a lot of detail these small fluctuations, which are, um, <clears throat> which produce this beautiful plot. This is the amplitude of these fluctuations. And uh, the, the solid line is what theory tells you, including inflation and so on also. And the, the dots are the experimental values. And that, that changed cosmology from a speculative uh, science to precision science. So this is the level of precision as the best experiment we can have on Earth. So essentially, detecting the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background has changed the, the, the vision of what cosmology is. It's not longer speculative. It is a real uh, science with, a, with numerical precision that can be tested experimentally and has been tested in a very successful way. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, this is small fluctuations that were quantum in, uh, the, in, in inflation, they can be uh, put to test and still people are testing uh, even two or three weeks ago, there's a recent result from BICEP uh, limiting this, this parameter space of all the, all the variables that which are uh, in, in, in inflation. So they're putting more and more constraints on, on, the, on the test. I here just wanted to emphasize in this plot is that this fluctuation that came out uh, quantum mechanical in, at the microscopic level are the ones that at the end are creating this large scale structure that we see in the galaxy. Why is it in, in the universe? Why is it that in some places the universe there are galaxies and in other places there's empty space and in other places are more galaxies and so on? It's because these galaxies are just a, a this, this quantum fluctuations that, that we were talk, talking before made big by the expansion of the universe. So now this is essentially the whole structure of the universe, essentially based on this fluctuation from inflation, can be explained in terms of quantum fluctuations determined by the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, which is mind blowing, I would say. <laughs> okay, there are some puzzles that people still do not uh, understand. Very recently, <clears throat> there's a small uh, disagreement on the measurement of this Hubble constant that uh, precisely because of the precision is getting better. Now, uh, the different experiments are giving you different uh, results. And so there's a tension there. So you see from experiments seen in the early universe, you see uh, um, is, uh, uh, uh, this whole parameter of 467. You see from supernovae or other uh, recent uh, uh, scale universe, you will see it, it will look like 73 or so. So, the, uh, and the precision is so good that in principle it is looking as a challenge and we don't know how to explain that yet. It may still be a statistical fluctuation. So it's something to keep an eye, but not to be too much worried. The thing that is a real puzzle and it was totally surprising when it was discovered, it was 1998 is what we call now dark energy. Is uh, I told you about this uh, accelerated period of, uh, uh, of expansion at the beginning of the universe. But now people is saying that there's also another expansion happening now. And this is totally against what we expected because as I told you, gravity was the dominant force at a large scale because the atoms were electrically neutral and the other forces are short range and gravity is attractive. So if the universe, all the galaxies were separating from each other, at some point we were expecting that gravity was going to slow down the expansion because they're trying to, to stop and to, to, to attract them back. Uh, but actually there's something there that we don't know what it is. And that's, it's called dark energy that is actually creating and uh, making this, the separation of the galaxies faster and faster and faster. So it's beating gravity somehow by making the, the universe expanding faster and faster. That means the universe is accelerating today. It's, much, it's acceleration which is far much more uh, uh, smaller than the big inflation that happened at the, uh, is believed to happen at the beginning of the universe, but it's still accelerating. So the, the, the acceleration is positive. And that gives us that, that you measure what is the, the, the amount of energy in the universe. So the atoms and everything I told you given by the standard model is only less than 5% of all the energy. And most of the energy is, comes from dark energy. There's another uh, contribution to the, to, to the energy coming from dark matter that I will mention next. So essentially, we do not know most of the source of energy in the universe. So those are 
big challenges, one of the big challenges we have. Uh, just to, to, to tell you uh, in detail about this dark energy, dark energy, the simplest explanation is what is called a cosmological constant that Einstein should introduce from his equations and then he thought it was a mistake and he took it back. Um, the question we had before the 1998 discovery of dark energy, it was why this cosmological constant was zero, which is, an, is, is the energy of the vacuum. And, and, and people believe that it was zero because it was very small. However, um, it's after the discovery of dark, of, of dark energy that the universe is accelerating, uh, the simplest explanation is that the, the energy of the vacuum, the, this is, imagine you can see the energy profile of the Higgs that I would told you, I'm just, just here in two dimensions, and the minimum, I didn't put it at zero, but it's a small amount. And what is, how small this is, it is of this order, zero point, and you, if you can count the number of zeros, it's 120 <laughs> times the non, uh, natural scale that is called the Planck scale to the fourth. Okay, so, the, so then the big challenge is why this number is not zero first, and second, why it's so small? And, and any other cor any correction that we know in, in, from what we know in physics, it will, it will give you a, a vacuum energy which is much bigger than that. And so why is it so small is a big mystery. So that's, that's, um, that's something to keep in mind. This is dark matter. As I told you, people have been collecting information, uh, uh, evidence for many, many, many years. Um, since the 1930s, uh, uh, uh, Zwicky and then Vera Rubin later on, and many people now uh, essentially that if you look at the rotation curves in, in, in galaxies and so on, um, the, if he, uh, you will have predicted if, if, if the way that they measure it would be due to the matter that we see, it will, the, the, will look like this. The velocities will, will be decreasing essentially with, a, with a distance. And what, but what it is observed is that it is actually almost flattening up on the, it is increasing a little bit. Uh, and then the, the simplest explanation is that there is an extra matter that is dark, dark meaning that it doesn't interact with electromagnetic interactions. It may be an, another particle that we have in the score. And, and it's still a mystery why, what it is. So that's another of the questions. And this evidence has been accumulating. And here's a, uh, this is the, the bullet cluster where you can see two galaxies passing through each other and the different colors that you, the visible part and, and, the, and, the, and the signature from, from what the gravity is from the dark matter. So you can see that there is evidence it exists, but we don't know what it is. But now the fundamental problem is uh, at the level of, of, of understanding physics is describing gravity at the quantum level. So I told you at the beginning, there are all these interactions on the uh, particles and so on, and that there was a, a, um, the graviton. The graviton, we can describe it, but only in an expansion in, the, uh, in energies. Uh, uh, uh, we, we study at energies smaller than a given energy. But you, you cannot explore it at all the uh, all energies. That's what people call a non generalized theory. We can do calculations, but we cannot go all the way to arbitrary energies, contrary to the other three interactions. And since Einstein believed that, that, that uh, it told us that actually gravity can be understood in terms of geometry, what we are actually asking is, is something fluctuations, like I told you before, quantum fluctuations from the uncertainty principle, but of space time itself. So essentially, we believe that the concept of space and time should be changed somehow when we go to smaller and smaller distances. So at some point, uh, space and time cease to exist and we don't know what, what describes it. And that's what we, we want. We, we are all looking for a proper theory of quantum gravity. To give you an, an, an idea about this, the, how difficult this is, this is, just to formulate a theory, but eventually to test it, it is because uh, Planck, the same Planck of, of, of, of quantum mechanics, he came out with an <clears throat> with a issue about um, scales. He said there is, uh, you have a theory that includes the quantum, that means h bar, then as relativity, speed of light, and includes gravity, this is the, the uh, gravitational constant. Out of it, you can make something of, of that with the dimensions of unit of energy or mass, because of mc squared is the same thing, and you get a number which is 10 to the 19 GeV. A GeV is an, uh, a unit, and this is essentially, it tells you them, is one GeV is the mass of a proton, just to give you an idea. So the natural, a uh, unit this is 10 to the 19 GeV. And uh, in, if you do the same exercise for distances, this will be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. In time is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. And this tells you 
of our ignorance. So that means that distance is smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Nobody knows how to describe physics. And time is smaller than 10 to the minus 44 seconds after the Big Bang. We don't understand physics. That's what we do not understand the Big Bang. And we are exploring in this um, LHC at CERN when they discovered the Higgs, we're exploring these energies and these distances and the, the scale of gravity is this small. So it's like 15 orders of magnitude smaller in distance and bigger in energy. And that's why it will be very, very difficult to, to, to, to test any, any, any idea about quantum gravity which will face this problem to, to be able to, to, to, to be tested experimentally. How am I doing with time? I just How much time do I have? 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Very good. So um, we have no problem with time. Please feel free. Okay, very good. Thank you. So I, I'll try to finish in time. So, um, and people, of course, being the most, most important problem in, in physics, the most fundamental problem, someone asks you, what is the most important problem in physics? You have an answer. The answer is, Describe gravity at the quantum level, at the microscopic level. And great minds have been trying to understand that from since the 1960s. I, I showed three of my favorite, the, the, the, the leaders in the field, Bryce DeWitt, uh, John Wheeler, who was the supervisor of uh, Feynman and, and, and, and, and a great physicist himself, he introduced the, number, the name of black holes. Um, there's a, the basic equation in gravity and quantum gravity is called the wheeler DeWitt equation. It's the equivalent of the Schrodinger equation for, for quantum mechanics. And Stephen Hawking, who I had the honor to, to, to, to, to know him quite well when he was still alive here in Cambridge. And I had a great admiration also for him. Um, and uh, they have made some uh, incursions into the quantum domain for gravity. Uh, the, probably the, the big surprise is that uh, uh, Hawking in the 70s realized that the black holes are not black in the sense that black holes were supposed to not leave any, anything leave the black hole because the black hole there was matter was so dense that you you try to, to send a, a, a signal out of the black hole uh, uh, the escape velocity will be bigger than the speed of light so even light will be still will, will not escape will, will be returned to, to, to, to the black hole and uh, but Hawking say well that's the fact in classical physics in quantum physics you can have again the vacuum fluctuations. And the vacuum fluctuations you can create particles and antiparticles for a moment of time. One particle can be trapped into the black hole and the other one goes away and that looks like radiation. And so in that sense that you will see radiation coming out of the, of the black hole and that is Hawking radiation. He also pointed out as a fundamental problem, he said precisely because of this radiation, it looks that the, that radiation is thermal. So it will be seen, it doesn't matter what, you, what goes into the black hole, the, the, the, the, the outcome will be on just, just a thermal radiation and we'll have, you will be losing all the information that came into, into the black hole. And, uh, and that's a question of principle, not, not, not of practice. And, and that, is, that has been keeping people in the last 50 years trying to understand this problem of Hawking. So actually he even had a bet and he lost the bet because now we believe that the information is not lost, but nobody still has, uh, can prove why it's not lost. And, uh, and then from here, ideas from Hawking, Hartle, Belenkin, and all came, came out also about using this what wave function, the, the, this function of quantum mechanics for the whole universe. And then you can start quest asking questions. You can create a universe from nothing uh, uh, in the same way that you can create a particle and a particle from, not, from the vacuum. And so the people started exploring that since the 70s and a lot of interesting ideas came out. Uh, um, and people have been still exploring that for, for many years. Uh, however, in the 80s, a, a whole community doing particle physics, knowing that the standard model has been closed and so on, essentially moved towards a theory that, that emerged at that time just by chance from particle physics called string theory. And string theory has been probably the, the leading uh, uh, proposal for describing gravity at the quantum level. And I will spend a few minutes just telling you about the string theory. Uh, so in a nutshell, a string theory will tell you that every particle that we see is actually not a particle, not a point-like object, but it's, it, it has a, a dimension like a, a standard uh, object. So this is, uh, for instance, what I'm showing here is like, like a magnifying gla uh, glass. So you see this point looks like a point, but you see it through the magnifying glass and it happens to be 
a closed stream. So the, what, the particle we call the graviton is a graviton, but it's not a pong-like object, but it would be a string-like. And this red one, instead of uh, that would be a photon, for instance, and instead of it being just a point, it would be a, a string, but it would, in this case, it would be an open string. And the os oscillations of, this op of these strings, will, since the oscillations are quantum, they will, have, they will take sp special values of energies, and that's, that will be different particles. So that's a nice picture, but it has a fast reaching implications because um, essentially one of these particles, like as you like it or not, you start with the theory only of strings. You don't impose anything else, a string in arbitrary space time. And you have to have one of these particles will be a massless particles of a spin two, and that's precisely the graviton. So string theory predicts gravity in, the, in that sense, which is you, you don't put it by hand, but it predicts it. And it is quantum to start with. So in that sense, it, it, it, it, it is naturally a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, but not only the gravity, it can, predict, it can predict many other particles like the photon and the quarks and so on. So in principle, it can have all, all the solar uh, particles and interactions. And that's, that's what it's, it's not only a theory of gravity, but besides describing gravity, also describe everything else in principle. And that was Einstein's dream. So you have heard that Einstein's been so the last 30 years of his life, trying to find the unified theory of all interactions and everything, he failed very badly. And the string theory is the only uh, candidate that actually provides that, that hope that eventually he has all the ingredients to have all the particles and all the interactions, including gravity, into one single uh, theory. Uh, one of the predictions of the string theory, it has very few, and uh, you may see it's a wrong prediction because it predicts that we live in 10 dimensions or sometimes we can say that's 11. <clears throat> so I will say that that is a positive and a negative thing. It's positive because it is the first time that a theory is not uh, this, uh, formulated in a particular dimension. You, you can just have arbitrary number of dimensions and the, and the dimensionality emerge from the calculation from the theory and the theory is consistent, you have only this 10 or 11 dimensions. Um, that's one point. But on the other hand, it doesn't coincide with the four dimensions of, of, uh, of space time that we see. You have time plus the three dimensions we are used to. Uh, so the, the way out of that is say, well, these four dimensions we see, we see them. And the other dimensions, we may not be able to see them because uh, we cannot explore distances small enough. So the other six dimensions may be very small that we don't see. And uh, that I think it was something that people had proposed already uh, 100 years ago, ago without the string theory, something called Kaluza and Klein theory, <clears throat> that we said we, you may have a fifth dimension, the fifth dimension may be like a circle and the circle may be too small. So string theory essentially generalizes that to have many, uh, six of these dimensions or more. Uh, I have to say that only in this century, a few years ago, people were able to actually, within, within string theory, to actually compute the size of these extra dimensions and determine solutions for which they are small. So now it's not just an assumption or a dream, but it's a result out of a calculation. Of course, the 10 dimensions are also a solution, but there are solutions for which you have four dimensions big and six dimensions small. So that, that is, is not just an assumption or a dream, but it's something that comes out of calculations. And then there are other stories like uh, uh, there are extra dimensions of equivalent to particles of spin one half. So they're called uh, fermionic dimensions. And um, when it's a symmetrical supersymmetry that, uh, uh, uh, that may, is yet to be discovered. So essentially, just to give you an idea, every point in the space time now is, instead of being a point, it's actually, uh, it has six extra, extra dimensions, which are very small and we don't see them. And uh, the question was, I told you, is to determine the size and shape of these extra dimensions. This has been a lot of work in the last 15 years or so. And, and, and with concrete results. Uh, and, and, and, uh, but so people have found that, but on the other hand, they have found a extremely large number of solutions. So imagine the number of uh, spaces of six dimensions with many holes and, and handles and so on. Mathematically, they're uh, unlimited. And uh, it is a belief that probably is finite at this number for, for the ones that give you from uh, string theory from with the right properties. Um, but it's, the number of them is maybe huge. Huge means 10 to the thousands or something. It's extremely num And each number will give you a different universe. So essentially, this is the picture that I showed in the poster. So you can see like a profile similar to the Higgs 
particle, but now it's many in many dimensions. Uh, each dimension uh, uh, and each minimum will give you a, a different of this uh, co uh, compact spaces with the uh, uh, fluxes and so on. And, uh, and, but each minimum will give you a different universe, okay? And how many minima you may have, uh, as I told you, it can be 10 to the thousands or so. Uh, classically, this, the, each universe will be living by itself, but quantum mechanically, we know that there's something called the, the tunneling effect. So you can, there can be a way to connect, connect this universe to these other universes. And then you can populate what is called the landscape. So this is what people call the cosmic landscape for many, many uh, minima. And the populating them, that would be, you can go for, you can create a universe out of the other universe and you can start creating many, many universes. So this is the picture of what called, people call the multiverse. We may be living in this universe. You can create a, a, a transition like, like creating bubbles when you hit wall, uh, water. Uh, so what, each bubble can be another universe that expands by itself, and then within that you can create another universe and so on. And this this is a very interesting picture. It looks kind of science fiction. Uh, however, Weinberg, from anybody else who is not a string theorist, he came out ten years before they discovered dark energy with the idea. He said, "Well, what about if dark energy? Uh, if, if if there is this cosmological constant?" Uh, what about if it is determined by an anthropic argument, meaning that, that uh, if it will be different, we will not be able to exist. And he predicted what the value should be. And what the value is, 10 to the minus 120, the same number of zeros that I show you in, in, in my plot of, of the cosmic constant. So he predicted and then uh, generalized his argument with other people. And, and that was before dark energy was predicted. But for that, he needed many, uh, when for this, to use this anthropic argument, he needed many, many universes, such to say, well, we live in one universe where the conditions are such that the cosmological constant is, is, has the right value, because if it were bigger, then the universe will expand very fast and it would be not possible to have the galaxies. And if we will be smaller, the same thing, we will not expand uh, fast enough, we will contract, and we will never have galaxies or us to exist. So we, are, we can only exist in a universe with a particular value of the cosmological constant. So if you need to have many, many, many universes such that you can uh, uh, use that argument. And the string theory provided that argument many years later. So I put, so this is the idea of this many, many universes creating out of that. So this is a very uh, strange story. A very, it looks like science fiction, as I said, but it addresses one key observational issue. Remember that I told you that any theory of quantum gravity will have a problem to, to, to be tested experimentally because we are, we, we are not able to reach those, those energies. Whereas indirectly, you have this picture. It is addressing, it is explaining somehow the why dark energy is as it is. So why we live in a universe where the cosmological constant is so small. Okay. I, I put always a question mark because this is only a proposal. Um, there are other proposals. I claim that this is the, the worst solution of the cosmological constant problem with the exception of all the other ones. And so essentially, uh, there are other pro proposals. I have, I have made some myself, but at the moment, this is the only one that stands the, the, the, the, the, the consistency of a framework and, and, and, and, uh, and the possibility to be a real explanation. On the other hand, I have to say, it's not yet fully uh, uh, under control. Okay, so that's the picture of string uh, theory. Then there's an unexpected discovery, which is totally theoretical. And that comes under the name of Juan Maldazena. Maldazena is probably the leading figure in theoretical physics at the moment. He's in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. And at the end of last century, he came out with this totally strange idea. He does say in his space that I hear is representing what is called uh, anti-decitor space, with space, space time, five dimensions with a non-trivial curvature <clears throat> and, and that's what I call ADS. And uh, he realized or he proposed that the physics into those uh, five dimensional space time would, is equivalent to the physics just on the boundary in which there is no gravity. So gravity will have the whole space time in the boundary which has one dimension less and no, no gravity will have the whole information of, of, of the bulk, of the information on the bulk. So in that sense, if the big problem in physics is to understand gravity at the fundamental level, he was telling you, well, that gravity at the fundamental level is equivalent to the theory without gravity that we understand on the boundary. 
So this proposal uh, is called ADS-CFT of or holography because they are relating uh, the, the theory in one dimension to another to dimension less. Um, it has been accumulating evidence after evidence over the past 25 years or so. And uh, it has been probably used to, for, for several things. So in that sense, this so far is the best way to, that we have for particular uh, backgrounds, a, a, a description of gravity at the fundamental level. Um, <clears throat> also recently people have been able, and, and, and in another context with the string theory, have been able to compute what people call, some people claim is the most beautiful equation in physics. And, uh, and that is the entropy of black holes. And uh, that is proposed. That was proposed by Bekenstein and Hawking, and it fits very well with the name black hole also. Um, and an entropy, which we know that is a thermodynamic quantity, it's, I mean, the temperatures and so on, uh, here is related to a geometrical quantity, which is area, which is the area of the black hole, or the, what is called the horizon of the black hole. Okay, so you're relating a geometrical quantity, area, fitting with Einstein's picture of the geometry being fundamental to a totally um, thermodynamical quantity, which is entropy. And the, the, the, the, the, um, the factor relating both includes all the constants of nature that we have seen. H bar means quantum, G means gravity, C the speed of light, and then it includes here the Boltzmann constant, constant that relates temperatures to energies. And it, this is the, the only equation that has all these fundamental constants together in one single equation. Okay. And uh, so that was proposed by Bekerstein and Hawking and so on. And only um, uh, within string theory, um, um, Stromgen and Waffa computed the, the, some 20 years ago and more recently using this idea, CFT idea, people computed the entropy because the entropy you can compute by counting the number of degrees of freedom. And it, it's essentially that, that is, that is uh, uh, the entropy is the logarithm of the number of degrees of freedom. So you just count the number of degrees of freedom in some black hole system. You can count, just compute the entropy and compare to the area of the black hole and you get precisely this equation. So this equation, you can describe it mic microscopically by counting the microscopic degrees of freedom here and get the, this, this the area. So that's one of the uh, achievements say, within string theory. And um, this equation, uh, oh, oh, and people also you have been using uh, this ADS-CFT arguments of, for solving this information paradox, because say, uh, Hawking said all this information of the black holes is an issue about black holes with gravity, but then the, the, this uh, holography tells you, well, that's equivalent to a theory without gravity in which information is never lost. In quantum mechanics and normal life, it doesn't, you don't lose information. So at the end, we don't know how information is preserved within the black hole because we don't know the interior of the black hole, but what we know the outcome is that at the end of the day, information will not be lost. So still, <clears throat> it's a lot of activity now to understand it on this on this on the geometrical side. That equation was the, the favorite equation for many people, in particular for Hawking. Hawking requested that in, in his in his grave they should be written that equation of the entropy because he said the most beautiful equation in physics. And actually, you go here to the um, to the uh, Westminster Abbey here in London. Where, where Hawking is, which is uh, one of the most inspiring places in the world for a physicist, because you can see Hawking is standing there besides Newton, Faraday, Maxwell, and on the other side is Darwin. So essentially the greatest minds in science, with the only exception of Einstein, I would say, uh, uh, uh, are there. And Hawking is very happy, very, I mean, honored, I think, to, to have been chosen a place there. Um, However, they, they, they didn't write the, entropy, the, the equation he wanted. He wanted the entropy equation and they wrote the temperature. This is the Hawking temperature, that is, which is for which he is known, uh, but this is not what he wanted. Uh, and, and this is a beautiful equation, and, uh, but still it's, it's interesting that at the end, people who decided this uh, didn't uh, um, check that uh, Hawking had requested the other equation. Uh, but then I happened to be in the same college as uh, Stephen Hawking was, and in my college, we discussed that we should have a, space, a special place in Gunville and Keys College uh, to, to write the equation that Stephen had requested. So we had here now something to remember Stephen Hawking and with the famous phrase that he kept saying that, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. And uh, <clears throat> so essentially I finish here just to summarize in the two slides, great discoveries. If you want to remember something I said, 
I will summarize four great discoveries in the past 25, 30 years. The fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background that essentially describe the, the, the, the, the structure of the universe at the beginning and then fitting with the distribution of galaxies now. The dark energy, 1998. The Higgs discovery in 2012 and the gravitational waves in 2016. Each of them have been awarded uh, Nobel prizes in, uh, uh, recently. So that shows that the field is thriving. There are many things going on. And from the experimental side, of course, on the theoretical side, there are ideas like string theory, inflation, and this ABS-CFT and so on that are still yet to be fully confirmed. Challenges is still, you have a theories for a proposal for quantum gravity is still not yet uh, um, finished. Uh, string theory and other alternatives are not fully uh, understood as theories. And then questions of big band, dark energy, information loss, dark matter are still in the open. So there's plenty to be done for many people. So I stop here and thank you very much. Fernando, thank you so much for this very nice, comprehensive and exciting talk. That was great. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we can now pass to session questions and answer. So we can have, uh, can have some questions. Please send us your questions using chat button, as you say, by message or just raise your hand. We have also received some questions by email. May I ask you these questions, uh, Fernando? Sure. What does string theory predict for cosmology with its very hot, very rich landscape? Yes, it's, uh, well, it's, I would say the <clears throat> it's, it's a very good question, definitely. Because once you have so many solutions, you say, well, it's, it's difficult to to come up with a prediction, which are a string theory prediction. And, uh, and that has been what many of us have been uh, struggling because uh, uh, so one of them that, that if, if this picture of the landscape is correct, that will tell you well that that's that the different values of the cosmological constant. So in that sense that that that that, that will uh, essentially will be a try, an attempt to an explanation of something that has been observed, which is dark energy. However, what we like to have is something I say, well, something that can be observed uh, uh, new that a string theory predicted. For instance, um, uh, the source of the cosmic uh, of, of the density fluctuations of the cosmic array background. Um, a, an explanation for inflation. If inflation is the correct theory of the early universe, inflation lacks a theory behind. So you can get inflation from string theory in a well uh, defined way. You can probably uh, uh, uh, get a prediction. Uh, so on Unfortunately, or, or fortunately, there, uh, there are very few, but not, so, not only one, few proposals of inflation from string theory. I would say for the 10 different uh, proposals, which I've seen, you can classify in two or three. And uh, so, so there cannot be a prediction of the theory, but predictions of classes of models from the theory. That's already good enough. That I compare with the standard model and quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is the theory behind you know, using special relativity and quantum mechanics. But the standard model that uh, Weinberg, Salam, and others uh, discover is, is one particular model out of an infinite number of them. So at some point you can and just say, we believe in quantum field theory because the standard model is, is, is predicted because there are very few uh, predictions of quantum field theory itself. So models of inflation from string theory getting um, <clears throat> something called cosmic trends that can happen there. Now my favorite one, and that, that I can spend a few seconds on that, is gravitational waves that I, I hope it will uh, develop. Uh, it so happens that I told you that exploring the Planck, getting to the Planck scale, so that, uh, which is almost un, un, un, uh, impossible to, to, to achieve within our uh, uh, facilities at the moment or in the near future or, or, or even planned future, we cannot get colliders to be at that high energy. Gravitational waves are opening totally new way of seeing things. One is that there may be gravitational waves from inflation and people are putting tests right now how big this uh, uh, uh, amplitudes are. That will be one big thing. The other one is that many anything that happened beyond the standard model all the way to the scale of strings would produce gravitational waves. There's people call phase transitions, uh, reheating, preheating after inflation, 
something called oscillons, boson stars, many things, produce gravitational waves <clears throat> and tend to be of relatively high frequency. So now we are starting a, a community to try to, to plan future experiments to go beyond the, the frequencies that people are spurring now. People are spurring up to, up to the kilohertz and, not, and, and they will go to smaller frequencies, but not to higher frequencies. So exploring frequencies of the other megahertz, gigahertz, and so on, which is natural for electromagnetism, it will provide a lot of information uh, of early universe cosmology and for uh, scales as high as the scale of a string theory. So in that sense, that pro that's much more promising. And people, we are talking about experiments that can be, you know, the higher the frequency, the smaller the experiment. So you don't have to have huge colliders of anything. <laughs> so you can do it uh, in a tabletop experiment. The only thing you need is a precision to, to, to detect that. And that I think is, is very exciting. So I would say at the moment uh, that it would not happen in the next five, 10 years, but there's potential that it may happen in the next 30 years or so. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We have a question in, in message chat. What is uh, from Varga Kalantaro? What is, is known about the dynamics of gravitational waves? Can they break down in the finite time? In a finite time? Can, can they, sorry, what was the last point? Break down, break down in finite Break down in finite time. No, I think that those gravitational waves are just, you, we can think about, you know, uh, the, the way I like it to, to, to think, which is the, probably the, the easiest, the simplest is to essentially the same thing as, as uh, electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are just fluctuations of an uh, electromagnetic field, and just which are just the photon, the classical manifestation of the photon, and gravitational waves are just the classical manifestation of the graviton. So the nice thing is that uh, uh, they can pass through matter, something that, that uh, uh, because gravity is so weak, and so it's, it, they can you can get a lot of information that you cannot get from electromagnetic waves. In particular, you can go farther in, on time, in time uh, to see what the gravitational waves, you can see the, the very, very, very, very beginning of the universe. And, and they have been traveling all around the universe and, and, and until now, and almost unchanged because again, gravity uh, interacts extremely weakly. So in that sense, it's up to us to have good enough detectors to be able to detect all these things, all the gravitational waves that have been produced at any time in the history of the universe. And we have not been able to see them because we didn't know how to detect them. So that's what I think it is such an exciting subject of, of uh, uh, exploring gravitational waves. Thank you. Fernando, uh, there's a question in, in message. Can you this, see these yeah. messages, message chat? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Um, long, but maybe you can read quickly, so. Okay, I'm reading, okay. No, I came from Osgur. Okay, hello, Osgur, nice to see you. Um, he said, the vacuum energy density we measure cosmologically is about uh, MeV to the four, which is 10 to the 122 times more than the QFT prediction. Uh, would it be still a big problem from string theory of view if would have measured vacuum energy density value is about negative uh, MeV to the four? No, that's a very interesting question. Uh, no, no, uh, I would say, um, uh, so you can get from, um, I think the negative vacuum energy is, is easier to get. So to get anti the sitter as, as, as I showed you in the, in the previous slides, uh, ADS, that is, it means anti the sitter means a, a space time with a negative cosmological constant. And, uh, and those are better behaved than the space with positive cosmological constant because uh, there's this uh, symmetry called supersymmetry that I didn't talk about. Is, is uh, you can have it in, in anti the sitter, but not in the sitter. And string theory inherits that symmetry. So it's, in string theory, it's, it's easier to get solutions which are anti the sitter. And now, precisely because <clears throat> you can get an anti the sitter, and, and every component of the standard model contributes to the vacuum energy, the bosons contribute in a positive way, the fermions in a negative way. So you, uh, uh, depending on uh, the balance between bosons and, and fermions, if they can cancel each other, but one can win over the other one. You can have more positive or more negative. So, so if, if what is observed is negative and whatever you got was positive, then, then you have more fermions, the fermions will lower down to, to the negative or the other way around. Now it looks like it's positive now. Uh, and, and you, from a string theory, you get something negative. Then the standard model particles can just help you to, to bring it to the positive. So in that sense, yes, it, it will not be a, a, a problem for string theory. 
uh, actually on the contrary. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have uh, another question. So yeah, you know, sometimes people talk about the new physics and so on, so on. So we have received the questions which states that is there a real need or possibility for new physical theory beyond beyond string theory? What do you think about it? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. There is a whole community, or <clears throat> even I think before string theory. So that. There are several attempts, people trying to discretize space-time and, and, and to do it as a lattice. Uh, there's something called uh, loop quantum gravity, which is trying to, to follow more or less some steps in, in, in, um, in, in, in field, uh, field theory without gravity to understand gravity. Um, they, use, they, they phrase some of the problems of string theory. They have the same problems of string theory in the sense that we cannot test them because of the same problem of, of quantum gravity of, of, of the Planck scale. Um, and they are less ambitious than string theory because they're, they're aimed at just addressing the issue of quantum gravity and not the whole other interactions. Uh, however, I think that it is worth exploring them because we do not understand fully string theory other than what is called non-perturbative regime. And this theory, some of them are precisely uh, formulated in the number to water regime. So at some point, there may be some matching uh, if, if, if both things make sense. At some point, if it's a fundamental theory, it's better be unique. <laughs> so so, uh, so if, if, if one or more than one uh, uh, is, is consistent, uh, so what I would expect is that they will be matching with each other in some regime. So for instance, we do not understand spring theory at the number to water level. Uh, <clears throat> so many things can happen there. So all these other attempts that people are, are, are trying may be useful for, for that. Yes. Um, oh, well, I, I can see now that the, the, the, the answer from Osgur. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems original that the universe is consistent with negative MEV to the four for redshift values larger than two. I didn't know. And this solved various tensions of the lambda CDM. Okay, uh, I don't know if I understand uh, because it's, I I th I, th I thought that the, the tension is has been between a closed universe or an open universe um, with, with the sign of k, not of lambda. But uh, are you saying is the issue about lambda or k? Because k, I, I agree. I mean, there's there's a, a, a an argument now if, if the universe is closed or flat because. Uh, some people are doing the, the analysis of experiments. They get that, that experiments somehow favor a little bit a, a, a closed universe. That, that means K is, is, is, is, is positive. Uh, but for about lambda, I didn't, I didn't know. So probably, yes, I didn't, I didn't understand. Thank you very much. Indeed, our speaker tied. I think we all a little bit tied. So oh. uh, let me ask last questions, Fernanda. Last questions, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, does string theory indeed resolve the black hole information paradox? If yes, we would have test of some testable implications. Some oh, very good. questions <laughs> came <from> by email. <laughs> by email. <laughs> very good. Very good. The, the black hole information paradox is an interesting thing. Uh, you know, Hawking formulated it in 1976. So you can see uh, more than 50 years. Uh, and people have been working, some people have spent their whole career just trying to understand, to solve that question, which is, for an outsider, it's surprising because it's, it's not a fundamental, it's not an experimental question. It's a question that came out of the mind of Hawking. <laughs> but uh, the idea is, is, the important thing is that if we understand that question, probably then we, we claim that we may start understanding quantum gravity. That's, that's why people are doing it. And I think it makes sense. And uh, it so happens that only in the last two years, uh, very, uh, there, there were two uh, papers by young people. The, uh, one is Pennington, who was a student in Stanford, and the other one is Anne Haley and, and Marolf and, and, um, and others who are, uh, most of them are very young, also the, below 30. They, they made a breakthrough uh, using what this concept is called, um, uh, uh, well, uh, entanglement entropy in, in, in a, a, a holographic way. And so in that sense, using ideas or this inspiration from media CFT. And, uh, and they came out that, that the proposals of objects, uh, uh, regions they call islands, which are hidden behind the black hole, 
for where this the information is stored. And once, once you include those degrees of freedom into the, your counting of entropy, then you, you, you get everything to work. And then you can see that the information is, is not lost. The way to measure that is something called the page curve that according to, is, is, is, is how the entropy changes. And according to, to Hawking, the entropy was is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with time. And Page, many years ago, said, well, if, if information is preserved, the entropy should increase at some point, and then at some point it stop increasing and decrease. And what these people managed to get is precisely to, to get the Page curve, the, the, the, the, this decreasing. So that is probably the, the major progress in the last 34 years was done two years ago by these young people. Uh, it's not yet the solution, the full solution of the, of the, pro, of, of the problem, but looks very promising. I think, I think it's a lot of uh, activity in that direction. And I think it's, it's, it's, it's good to, to, to try to read those, those, uh, those papers. I think Maldacena and others have been writing review papers. So I think it's, it's, uh, they're, it is accessible to, to the general public. And uh, <clears throat> so this is, uh, however, uh, this Hawking radiation itself, it's so weak that to, to be um, measured is something that, that's, that's why Stephen kept saying all the time that he, if someone would manage to measure the Hawking radiation, he will get a Nobel Prize, but he will, ne he will never get it because of that. And, and of course he, he died without the Nobel Prize. Um, and, and so people are trying to, just to measure something about Hawking radiation from what people call anal analog experiments to see some so some condensed matter experiments, you can see the, the same similar mathematical formulation of, of the Hawking radiation and then see that, that, that, that you can observe something there in terms of photons, you will see phonons and these kind of things. But, but uh, seeing the Hawking radiation experimentally is uh, the moment it looks out of the way. Thank you very much. That was great talk, very energetic, very motivating and comprehensive. Okay, so, well, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Will you, will you make some final remarks if you want? Uh, no, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I think I, I, I, I like very much uh, Turkey, Turkey physics, and, and uh, I have been very much involved, when, especially when I was at ICDP. Uh, we have had uh, very good experiences uh, with, for instance, people like, like Osgur when he came to uh, Cambridge, he was very productive. Uh, when I go there, we have, uh, have uh, students there and, uh, working, and so I, I can see, um, I feel uh, very, very close to the community in, in Turkey, and I, I, I hope it could continue like that, and I, I hope to be able to visit again, not yeah. in the far future. Yes, sure. thank you again for the That's thank you. We will be waiting for this in COVID-free world, uh, exactly. Exactly. to discuss all things in person, to have Absolutely. you here in person. Absolutely, very good. I'm looking forward. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so thank we you can stop okay. here if you don't mind. Sorry? We can we stop here if you don't mind? Perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.